Welcome back, everyone. I'm once again joined by Daniel Kakesh to discuss matters related to the Middle East. Today, we're going to be following up on a previous episode, episode number three, Mapping the Middle East, by going back in time to discuss the Ottoman Empire and the identity of the various people groups living in the Ottoman Empire in the period before World War I. Daniel Kakesh holds master's degrees in history and Eastern Christian studies and has previously taught courses at colleges and universities in the San Diego area in Middle Eastern studies and Arabic culture. Now's where I'm obliged to tell you to like, share, subscribe. So make sure you do. And let's get on with the podcast. Well, we we talked about previously the, the way in which the Middle East is laid out today and how understanding the borders and the map of the Middle East helps us understand some of the complicating factors in the region, right? Like why, you know, why is there trouble in some places and why isn't there? Um, what's the story behind all of this? And that that happened basically in the 20th century. Like that conversation was a, you know, well, what happens after World War One and the Europeans are all involved in the Middle East uh, officially, right? Like colonially, we could say, um, you know, and what do their influences mean for the people in the regions? Um, who grows up speaking French? Who grows up speaking English as their third or fourth language? Maybe their second language, but there's so many languages happening in the Middle East people forget or don't even know that it's um, its own melting pot, right? And I think what I'd like to explore today is what's the Middle East like before World War I, you know? And um, World War I, our context for the, for the World Wars is a, it's, it's either European theater or Pacific theater, right? Like we're, we're focused on what's happening in Europe or with the Far East and, and what Japan's doing. Um, we're not so efficient or we're not so effective in our understanding of, well, what's happening in the Middle East? World War II, we got North Africa. We know the North African campaign is where we land, you know, um, and where we first, you know, really meet the Germans in combat, but we being, you know, the Americans in this case. But, um, you know, occasionally we'll talk about I don't know. Some people will hear about the British in Egypt and things like that. You know, Egypt is a British colony after World War One, and so what? Why is the Middle East important in, in the era before uh, the First World War? Right? Like, and what's it like? You know, who's in charge, and um, you know, what sort of impact does it have on the whole region? I mean, I would say it's um, going into the twentieth century. It's and before World War One, it's still a very um, raw and natural um, uh, like area in comparison to what happens immediately after the war. So, um, and then it's important because, as you know, it's the meeting point of a lot of these of a lot of these. Um, I guess continents or, or even powers where you have already establishing the British and their their empire from the Victorian age and, and moving on uh, throughout Asia and Africa. So the Middle East is kind of like this this connector of the continents that is being viewed by the imperial powers. Um, the British ha already are, are before the war already have these kind of uh, uh, deals with with Arabian sheikhs here and there, um, let's say in Yemen or the Gulf, um, to, to find a way to connect their empires. Even the, the Shah of Iran was a friend of theirs. Uh, and the Ottoman state at the time was in the, the aftermath of the capitulations that it had signed um, with the European powers in their uh, 19th century inter-European wars. So some, for some reason, the Ottomans were always on the losing side of whoever was fighting. 
Um, and they eventually signed capitulations, whether they're uh, mostly economic, but also including religious things. This is why, for example, let's say the Catholic subjects of the Ottoman Empire, so Eastern Catholics, had more uh, government protection and and were favored over, say, the native um, versions of Christianity of the Middle East uh, because of capitulations they signed with the French, for example. Yeah, that makes sense, you know, and, and I think um, a lot of, well, many of us um, may like the easy explanation and not necessarily see how, you know, something that might be considered religious is really something political, or at least it has different arms. Um, and, you know, the French being the sort of the key Catholic or Roman Catholic players in the region and how they can um, steer diplomacy through people on the ground. And of course, you know, like that, that's always been an interesting, um, that's always been an interesting field because not just Christianity, right? Like, I mean, you mentioned the local versions of Christianity, whether it's sort of the, uh, the Greek Orthodox, the Armenian apostolic or the Armenian Orthodox, the Syriac Orthodox, the church of the East, there's all of these, um, native forms of Christianity present in the region. In Egypt, it's the Coptic, you know, Orthodox Church. And while that is the case, you know, you have all of the this different landscape of Islam, you know, um, the different denominations of Islam, as well as these quasi-denominations, the Alawi in, in Syria, the Druzi, um, you know. And so our, what ends up happening with with religion is religion starts to once again reflect ethnic groups right and so people groups and if it's not people group it might be alliance right so you could have people from the same region but one may be allied with the french and so they're catholics others may be allied with a different organization they may be you know they may maintain their native aramaic speaking you know syriac tradition or something like that and within that okay most people probably have no connection to the outside, to the European, right? Or we're, we're using Europe as an example here, but um, you know they may not have a connection to any of that, and they may just be like devotionally religious. And for them, um, it doesn't matter, you know, kind of how their village or how their region allies itself, how the leadership behind it allies themselves. Um, either way these groups may be considered a fifth column, right? Like a, a spy network. And that goes back to, um, you know, the, the ancient period, right? When it was Rome, uh, Eastern Rome and Persia fighting, where in the Persian empire, the Christians were considered for a, a brief period. I mean, this isn't, the Persians tended to be very open historically, but for a brief period, they were considered spies or potential spies for the Romans because Rome um, after 380, um, AD had adopted Christianity. And so the Persians look at their own citizens and were like, oh, you're the same religion as those guys, huh? Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that doesn't leave, right? You know, even the modern era and whatnot. And so you get that interplay in the um, uh, in the Middle East around the time of World War I and especially the Ottoman period. But the Ottomans, you know, if, if you look at the map, they kind of they seem to have most of the region that the Byzantine Empire did. Mm -hmm. the, and when I say Byzantine, I'm referring to the Eastern Roman Empire, the, the Imperial Roman power in the East, you know, and not necessarily in, in Western Europe. So they've got chunks of Eastern Europe, they've got Egypt, then they've got the, the Levant, the Levantine coastline, and then Mesopotamia, and of course, Anatolia, um, Anatolia, which today we would call Turkey, you know, what is this entity, you know, and, and what's its real effect on the region? So before I, I answer that, I just want to comment real quick on something you said, too, about the, the um, kind of the, the people groups and then on and their religions. And it's crazy how um, the like going into the division of the empire that we talked about before regarding World War One and Sykes-Picot and all that. Um, a lot of the decisions was based on were based on where these people groups were located on the map. So, like the French, for example, had they were they were saying things like, 
we have a historical relationship with the Druze. So give us the Druze areas, for example. Um, and also that the Ottomans, uh, they had, um, but they, they intentionally moved people groups around in, in like, say, for example, Circassians. They moved them from the Caucasus and they put them, say, in Syria or Jordan, what is today Syria or Jordan. And uh, so now, until now, these people groups are kind of mixed up and moved around and exist in these places. Uh, it's really interesting how that plays a role in, in modern day. Um, regarding your question, uh, the reason why there seems to be a coincidence of the territorial, like, uh, like identical um, proximity of where the Ottomans are versus where the Romans were is because the vacuum that was left by the Romans was absorbed by, like, so the, when the, when the Ottomans, their ancestors, the, the, the Turkic peoples, the, the Seljuks and, and these who come from Central Asia, Turkestan, um, just west of Mongolia. Uh, when they came with the Mongolians uh, as soldiers in their armies, um, they came, to, and the, uh, for the viewers who don't know, the Mongolians sacked the Abbasid Caliphate based in Baghdad. Um, and they, they ended, essentially, in de facto, ended the Arab Caliphate. The Arab Islamic Caliphate, the Arab Empire, was ended by the Mongols. So, so when the Mongols left, the Turk, the Turk stayed and converted and became part of um, the area. They didn't go back to Central Asia with the Mongols, and so, and they they came in multiple tribes, and they they had uh, uh, very decentralized uh, and mini states, if you will, throughout Anatolia, and even continuing to come from Central Asia. Uh, so then they invade, they, they absorbed what was left by the Abbasids, which was kind of the, um, the Semitic and African parts of what the Romans had. And then going into Anatolia, they were successful. Uh, they were successful going into Anatolia. Uh, the reason why, which the Arabs were not, is because the kind of transportation that they brought with them from Central Asia that the Arabs did not have access to. So an example of this, um, and during the Arab conquest, the Arabs had um, a kind of camel called the dromedary. Uh, dromedary is the one humped camel. It's very useful in the plains and in the deserts, but it's useless in hilly and mountainous terrain, which is why if you notice, it's only in hilly and mountainous terrain where people, you will find people who maybe don't speak Arabic necessarily, or, uh, and they weren't able to cross into Anatolia, which is very hilly and mountainous. Um, so then when the, when the Turks came, they brought with them the two hump camel, the Bactrian camel, like the one in Afghanistan and these areas. And, and that has two humps. It's useless in the plains and the desert which is why the Turks had a terrible time in trying to subjugate the, the peninsula. They didn't do very well there, but they did great in going to take Anatolia, eventually Constantinople and Eastern Europe. Um, so then they kind of unified what they inherited from the Arab Caliphate with what they conquered, that what was left from the Romans. And then it also uh, it ended up being exactly what the Rome or almost exactly what the Romans had before all of this. Yeah. So the infrastructure is there and so it's easy to maintain networks, you know, whether it's trade, um, whether it's you know, administrative capitals and, you know, where do you, where's a good place to base yourself to administer certain regions and, and to administer geography. Right. And I think that it, geography is one of those things that we um, it's easy to miss. Geography impacts a lot in the world. It impacts world history. Do you have a coastline, you know, and in your coastline, do you have natural ports or not? If you don't have natural ports, you probably don't have a ship building culture. You probably don't trade, you know, like why were Europeans, um, like why did they 
develop the way they did? Why did the Roman Empire especially develop the way they did? Well, look at the Mare Nostrum, look at the the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and just the natural landscape of what geography does to peoples as they develop. How does geography impact language, right? Like, you know, that's this is where I got to be careful. I may go off on a riff on this, but, you know, if you look at the way the Middle East is designed, you know, and um, well designed, it, well, the way it um, its landscape is, you can, you can measure and, um, connect dialects and language trend you can see where one language ends another begins and where there's kind of a liminal zone and um based on the trade route based on the mountain ranges based on the deserts that people don't cross versus the deserts people do cross you know where are the watering holes and how does that impact like why you know i was um i'm prepping another video for all these you know fun little learning things i'm doing now um where looking at ancient North Arabian looks a lot more like Hebrew, you know, in some cases. And so, um, or maybe we should say that Hebrew looks more like Arabic, you know, or at least this type of Arabic at, at, at this point in history when, you know, today you hear them like, be like, what? <laughs> maybe people don't understand each other, um, you know, when the two are spoken. And um, geography is sort of central to that. And so just to punctuate that point you're making about how they inherit empire, um, yeah, it's some sort of innovation and some sort of mobility. Now, who's living there at this time? You know, when the when the Turks are ruling, and can you talk about things like the millet system? And you know, how do how does the Ottoman Empire function over the Middle East, right? And you know, who and what and how? Like, what's going on? Sure. Um... When you're saying living there, do you mean any particular part or just in general? The whole well, part? yeah, good. Um, let's, you know, well, let's stick with what we know best, right? Like, you know, the so the Ottomans also um, ruled over Egypt. And I know that during that period, there's a lot of different communities that settle in Alexandria, you know, the, the main port city in Egypt. So you'll have like Armenian Egyptians. And um, like, I know some, <laughs> you know, and um they actually lived in Glendale, but they, they that was completely um, accidental. But, uh, you know, like there's a history of, uh, of movement and mobility. And like you described, there's people from the Caucasus, the Circassians who, you know, they're um, resettled or they're settled in other areas. And why do that, number one? And um, what's it like for places like Syria, Iraq, you know, Mesopotamia, the Levantine coast, um, even Arabia? How does their... How does this period, you know, set up what happens in World War One? Yeah. So uh, prior to World War One, prior to kind of the the twentieth century world, there were already sentiments of Arab nationalism happening in uh, the the I would say not just the the Semitic territories of the Ottoman Empire, but also the tribal areas, particularly. So you see, this is why. Um, there are Bedouin tribes and places like Raqqa or Orfa even um, to this day. Uh, because Raqqa's in of, Syria and Orfa is just north of the, oh, it's in Turkey, just north of Syria, sort of in the central, south central area. Yeah, so so they they moved them because they want to disperse these tribes and kind of separate them from each other to uh, you know, uh, divide and conquer kind of mentality. Um, even placing Circassians and Chechens and these kinds of uh, Turkuman, these type of people throughout wherever Arab tribes are, not just as like kind of to break up tribes, but also to have a pro-Ottoman presence in in the area, to not make the whole area kind of, um, what's the word, like vulnerable to the tribes. At, at any time, because before what was happening was, for example, there was a, uh, from the Majali, I think, tribe in Jordan, I think that was the Majali tribe, they they had a rebellion in Karak, and then they took over all of Transjordan just because. So, and there was nothing the Ottomans could do to stop them from south of Damascus until as, south, uh, as far south as Karak, I think, which if you look on a map, that's exactly everything from the Sea of Galilee, 
east of the Sea of Galilee directly, south of Damascus, through, down through the Dead Sea. And it, they could have kept going down if they wanted to through uh, Petra and, and to, like northern Hejaz and these areas. So, uh, and then as you know too, uh, Professor, the, um, the, the Arab revolt that happened in World War I, it wasn't that difficult. Um, to, like, yes, the, the British helped, but it's not like the Ottomans were that hard of an enemy going up the Hejaz Railway for the Bedouin Arabs to fight. So um, uh, the, the Ottomans did this a lot to secure the weaknesses of their empire. Um, just like I think had the Roman state, they would have had to do the same thing. It's hard to, especially these corners. I mean, even the the, the pagan Romans in the first century, they were they had to kind of put down rebellions in these parts all the time, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I think, and uh, I think you also asked the question about the millet system. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know what I'm interested in, and I I think a lot of our listeners and uh, listeners, not just the, I mean, maybe our listeners probably more know more than the gen pop, but you know, we don't grow up learning this stuff. We don't grow up with a, you know, we don't learn history in Africa, you know, prior to colonization or at least earlier colonization. Same with the Far East. Um, maybe some places we get a little bit more information than others in the Middle East, especially because it's been so um, intertwined. You know, the world has had a, a target literally on the region for a, a long time now and more than two decades. And um, it's part of our, uh, at least knowing about it, right? Like when Vietnam, when the Vietnam War happened, like who knew where Vietnam was or French Indochine, you know, like, what is this? Um, mm. Is it Chinese? Is it, you know, like, what is, is it India? It's Indochina. What does that mean? Right. And what is Vietnam? Like, so we, we tend to go through these cycles where we engage some part of the world and then that world, you know, becomes um, very proximate because of that engagement. And we learn a little more, but maybe not as much as we should. And I think with the Middle East in particular, there's something special about it. Namely, it's where civilization rises. And I hope what you and I are doing here, kind of going back in time, I hope we can like keep going back and, and as far as we can, you know, in, in these sessions we have. Um, and, and, you know, starting from, you know, your previous podcast with me and, you know, just looking at, well, how, who, who are we and where do we come from too? Because uh, the world, like Middle Eastern history it, at its earliest stages, and from my point of view is our history, it's world history, it's, um, it's culture and, and development is important to everybody. And I, that's why I, I spend so much time highlighting it. Um, that being the case, all, you know, all those things considered, rather, it's important for us, I think, to know some of the nuances. And like the millet system is a way of organizing people groups. And um, people, it, it was only until, you know, mass transportation, right? Think of the railroads, you know, forget the major sea journeys that brought people to the new world. Um, even then, people still were isolated after arriving in the new world, right? And so what ends up happening is people instead, uh, they don't leave their area wherever 30 miles of, you know, whatever their homeland is for most of their lives. Most people, you know, they kind of live in a county-sized area they don't leave the shire hobbits don't leave the shire right like that's something that's why bilbo was scandalous for for hobbiton right because he went how dare he he went on an adventure right and so um th but that that reflects like population mobility now people can move if they are moved and it's something that is happening under the ottomans um but it's not like they invented it like the Ass the ancient Assyrians did it, you know, they're really the ones who implemented that policy of people swapping, right? Taking a group from one region from Syria or present day Syria and relocating them into Mesopotamia along the, or along the Chabor, I guess that's still present day Syria, but people from like uh, Lebanon, Holy Land, 
these areas, settling them on the Chabor River in Mesopotamia proper. Babylonians did the same thing. You know, it's a, and that process continued. I mean, there's uh, Aramaic speaking Christians, you know, from uh, what we would call Southeast Turkey today, who were relocated to Bulgaria, right? And so, like, you do DNA, you know, with Bulgarians, a lot of them are going to show up like Mesopotamian. They've got Assyrian heritage, right? Like, how does that happen? You know, and I think that um, it's easy for us to, you know, fixate on a name, right? Like Assyria or Persia or uh, Byzantium, so the Seleucids, you know, things like this, and you know, or the, the the Arabs, right? Say, so, oh, the Arabs ruled now. Now you have a map, and now whatever is under the the Abbasids, you know, um, like that's Arab. But that's not the case, right? Like, okay, there's an it, there's an administrative truth to that, but who who is living there, and you know what are their lives like? And so I think that millet system, number one, explaining it because people don't they don't grow up learning what the heck a millet system is, and number two, who are the communities that are impacted by this system that the the Turks utilize? So milla, the Arabic way to to Say, I think, uh, and you would know more, Malfono, Millat, uh, it comes from the same root of the word uh, Mil or Tmil, like you, uh, like leaning, like even if you have something, like you have a hat on your head and you kind of slant it. Uh, so it's called, like we say, Mayelta, or it's like, you know, slanted leaning. So if you are in a Millat system, Oh, Milla, like one people. Until now, we use the word. We ask each other, "Who am ya Milla?" He's from which Milla? So literally, it means what? Which way does he lean? Uh, but uh, it, I guess in context, it's like, what is his uh, social identity inclination or something? Um, so it, uh, and I get. I think it's Semitic, but I don't know. I don't know if it's a, it's a Semitic word or not. The uh, the Turks obviously they're pronouncing the ta marbuta there millet. So um, for it's it's just kind of the the because the Ottoman Empire was so decentralized, something that it inherited from the Roman administration that it kind of has, and I would say even from the Caliphate it inherited. Um, uh, it has uh, like a a, a representation of each community in its empire, of um, and if a community was was small enough, it or what the Turks would consider small enough, a lot of the time it would be absorbed into maybe a similar but bigger community right. as representing it. Like I think this happened with the Armenians and the Syrian Orthodox for a while until the Syrian Orthodox just had enough and they wanted their own. Um, <laughs> so we don't uh, lean the same so way. The, <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the state was dealing with these communities with having representatives of these communities. There's an instance where, um, the patriarch of the Syrian Orthodox was in front of the Ottoman Sultan telling him to take it easy. And then the Sultan was like, uh, if you guys become Catholic, We'll take it easy on you. The Sultan tells the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch that, um, and this is this is honestly a lot of the reason why a lot of people became Eastern Catholics was just because they had it a lot better, you know. Uh, and then um, even from in the days before the Ottomans abolished the jizya and these kind of things that were um, like directly related to certain communities only. Define the, the jizya real speaking, quick before you know you move on, just for people who are listening. Yeah, yeah, sure. The, the, the jizya was a penalty tax placed on the people of the book um, uh, that they would have to pay for being subjects of a Muslim state uh, to receive, um, I guess, some citizenship rights regarding, uh, you know, uh, security, uh, uh, guaranteed um, like possession of their property and things like this, but it wasn't just money. There were other rules to your church. Your house couldn't be higher than the Muslim house. Your church couldn't be higher than a mosque. You weren't allowed to ride a horse in the normal way. You had to like kind of, you had, you couldn't walk on the sidewalk. 
uh, you have uh, if a Muslim's coming, you have to give him his your his your place. A, lo a lot of kind of second second class citizenship rules were part of the jizya. Uh, so all of this, um, th uh, this is something that comes down from uh, I think Omar Ibn al Khattab was the one who set up all the rules in, in detail, and then it was inherited. Since at least that's what Muslim tradition says. So. Uh, so then in the jizya days, the way in which these things were kind of executed or applied is through the millet system. So like, let's say like uh, Dr. Michael Winger, Daniel Kakish, we're not going to go as individuals and pay the jizya. It's going to be whoever the representative of our milla is, who's going to go pay the jizya on behalf of the whole milla together. And this is, uh, this is just an example I'm using of the jizya, but this is true for everything else in society. Like even till now, you see vestiges of it within the Republic of Turkey. Um, the, the Syrian Orthodox Bishop of Constantinople, uh, what's his name? I forgot his name, Sayyidna. I forgot his name, our bishop there. Uh, he, um, he intercedes on behalf of the Syrian Orthodox people and a lot of the time, of the Suryoye in general, not just the Orthodox, uh, to Erdogan and to the Turkish government, uh, it intercedes for us to them to get to make our situation better. Uh, the same thing for His Holiness Mara from the second with Bashar al Assad, and for uh, His Holiness Mar Awe the second, and the the Kurdish government in Erbil. Um, and even for Mar Luis Sako on behalf of the Chaldeans uh, for to the government in Baghdad. So you'll, you you find this style still existing in the Middle East. Yeah, Mar Philoxenus, Yusuf Chetan, I think is the bishop there. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, so basically it's a way of organizing people groups and not necessarily like, it, okay, think about the United States. Um, Canada, whatever, right? You've got states or provinces. You've got geographic reasons for organizing people. This, however, is a, you know may have geographic consequences, but it may not too. I mean, you may have Armenian um, people who live in Basra or something mm -hmm. like in, in mm -hmm. Lower Iraq, right near Kuwait. Um, you may have people in, in like Van, you know, Armenia proper, right? This region. Um, and so it's really like the question of, well, who controls the people group and you know, how many different people groups are there? You know, like we've got, um, well, I mean, it's not just like Christians and Muslims, right? Like the easy separation is, you know, identified through religion, but that's not the case because there's different Christian denominations. There's different Muslim denominations. There's Eastern Jewish communities at this time. I mean, there's Assyrian Jews in northern Mesopotamia, southeast Turkey, and um, well, it would be northwest Iran, but I'm not sure if the Ottomans had any um, sway in that region. But they you know, who, who are these people, right? Who yeah. who's living there, and who are the Ottomans organizing? Uh, again, like whether if it's the if it's the native population, uh, they will implant other ones to kind of be a, a thorn in their side, make them a little bit uncomfortable or they will move them intentionally like the Assyrians being in Hakkari or the Assyrians being in Urmi these are results of of um, movement they're not they're not particularly intentional destinations of the Assyrian people it just so happens that because of what was going on with the Turks or the even the the predecessor states of the Ottomans, like the white sheep and the black sheep, if you've heard of these areas. So they were pushing uh they were pushing like the Mardin Assyrians or the the um northern let's say uh Sapna Valley Assyrians and Nineveh Assyrians. They were kind of uh always being a thorn in the side of, of them, the, using Kurds too in these situations. So a lot of the time, and, and also the Turkoman, the Turk and the um, Azeris, the Azeris being in these areas in Urmi, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not by accident 
that all of this stuff happened. It's not by accident that there are Druze in particularly Galilee, South Lebanon, and uh, the Golan Heights, and Jabal al-Arab, the uh, Arab mountain, the Druze mountain. If you look at all this, this chunk of, of territory, it's between, let's say, Damascus and Beirut and Nazareth and um, uh, whoever knows Erbid and Ajino. So it's like this block of Druze right there in between North Syria Arabs, South Syria Arabs, or uh, the, the Turkoman being randomly in Kirkuk and Musli. Um, and then Kurds kind of being a, a, a separation between, say, the like Armenia proper that you mentioned earlier and where historical Assyria was or Aram, whatever you want to call it. So it's uh, the, the Turks know what they're doing. The, the issue became for them that, okay, um, like right now in Turkey, the number one enemy of the Turkish state in the mind of the Turkish state are the Kurds. Because, okay, we did what we needed to do with the Armenians and the Assyrians. But what about now who's left? The Kurds are left. So now you have to deal with that. Um, uh, the same thing for uh, and Iran, obviously, also had a, a, a similar, very it's different, but a similar kind of way in dealing with, with peoples in, in, uh, uh, in wherever the, the border was delineated at, like where you have the, the Arabs in, in the southwest there, the Azeris in the northwest, and the Kurds. It's very similar where they kind of place these people. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know the um the Kurdish question is an interesting one too because we've heard about them more recently in the news, you know, especially with our involvement in, in places like uh, northern Iraq and Syria. Um and we hear one term, you know, but there's many different types of Kurds, right? And um you know, I know several um, and there's some Iranian Kurds who don't understand any Kurdish language spoken, you know, like by the Kurmanji or Sorani speaking Kurds, right? And so these are just dialects of Kurdish. Um, it's a it's a complicated landscape, and I think that you know one of the the things I'm um, I'm wanting to explore more, you know, is just how much of a melting pot the Middle East is, and how you know there's um really it's it's kind of it's almost village to village in how people relate to one another even within the communities right like within the millets specifically you have um people who from the outside look like one thing but then when mm. you go village to village you're like okay these people talk really differently um you know your your west texas twang you know mm. versus your um you know, kissing the Blarney Stone Irish, you know, like from the outside, it sounds like English, you know, um, yeah. then no, not really. Like <laughs> there's a lot of different, <laughs> and actually those are, those accents are probably connected more directly than some of our others. Right. But, you know, the point is you, you hear not just through language, but through heritage, common tradition, you know, who um, traces their history back to what period and um, maybe what major figures, uh, outside obviously this is the letter of the law it doesn't mean this is what was applied all the time by certain the, a lot of the times the rulers were either secular or didn't care that much to apply these rules all the time or there were areas and this was uh, most likely a lot of the time the case there were uh, certain areas that were solely Christian areas and then in that case obviously it wasn't applied um and you, the, the more mixed areas, this is like the urban areas, such as like the big cities, Damascus, Baghdad, Basra, Beirut, or uh, even in Cairo or Alexandria. This is where you would have, you would find these rules being applied. Mm -hmm. um, and then even then, even then, maybe not to the fullest extent of the letter of the law, like the way ISIS did it. Well, I mean, we see like the, with the Nazis, you know, they would slap a, a badge that people would have to sew mm -hmm. on their clothing and whatnot. And um, 
that that goes back to identifying people groups. And so the question is, you know, how does how does that work politically or what's the what's the thought behind it? Is it for um, is it for preservation of X, Y or Z political group against, you know, maybe outsider or stranger? Um, is it to prevent um, subversion of one group into another? You know, I mean, I, like the immediate impulse of reaction we would have is kind of like, well, that's really backward. Why would you separate people? Because now everyone's integrated and we, you know, like everyone's interbred too, you know, and <laughs> right. Or at least we have the memory of and the intentionality behind our, our, our history and heritage um, in many cases. Right. And so we don't think of this as something useful, um, but what may have motivated it? Like, that's my question because you know, maybe you don't want people interacting and, and forget the, forget the religious elements. Like let's like pretend that everyone's a certain type of Muslim in, in, in the mm -hmm. Ottoman <laughs> empire. Right. Why are there all of these divisions within that case? You know, what's the political? Yeah. It's easy for us in 2022 when we hear this right away. We remember, you know, the kid, the kid in, in Auschwitz with the yellow star of David on his on his uh, like jail uniform. Like, okay, but it's totally not that um, because even before the Turks, this was already a way in which society functioned. Like, for example, uh, even in like New Testament biblical times when they would see a woman who's a Samaritan or a man who's a Samaritan, how do they know that he's a Samaritan? Well, it's obvious from the way he's dressed. Or uh, the Greek, they know him because look at how the Greek dresses and look at how we dress. Or here's this Arab over here. So this way was, uh, this this kind of way society uh, lived was was the normal way. How else do you deal with people? Well, do I want to kind of uh, defile, if I'm a Jew, I can't go to the Gentile and touch him or uh, go into there. I'm going to defile myself in, in that sense or whatever. You know, like the Muslims have this concept too of kind of the, after they do the wudu and stuff, they can't defile themselves. Shia are more strict about it. So they really need to know. Like if a Christian ate from this plate, I, I have to break the plate. I can't even wash it. Uh, you bury it so afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> like in, in Orthodox Jewish community, you'd have these similar rules, right? Maybe yeah. they're related. I don't know. I've never done a study. I don't, yeah. So um, it's important for the for a society that is functioning based on religious norms or um, that have that are part of the social norms. They haven't been separated from social norms. Uh, respecting it, it's it's kind of respecting everybody. Uh, to know. However, the problem became when society began to dress similarly. Like, for example, if you have uh, in the invasion of Islam prior to, you have Arab tribes who are Christian. Yeah. And the Christian Arab tribes are not dressing like the Suryoye. You know, they're Arabs, so they dress like Arabs. With the, he the means Jizu the Mesopotamian and Near Eastern Christians by that word. The Arabian... Um, the Arabian tribal Christians versus, say, the native Levantine and Mesopotamian Christians who are, who are Aramaic speakers. So then when the Jizya rules are being applied, the Arab Christians now lose that right of mm -hmm. being Arab, essentially, of, of dressing like Arabs or looking mm -hmm. like Arabs. Um, again, a lot of the time, maybe this was not applied as strictly, uh, but officially, the, these were the rules. Yeah, and it makes sense that in a, a place where interaction happens, that's where they would be more meaningful, right? You know, to have social identifiers. But, you know, again, I guess what I've tried to figure out is, well, okay, it's an, let's just say it's an inherited tradition that um, you identify yourself through your outward appearance. And that's an, like, that's an ancient thing, right? So, you know, only certain people could wear the Roman toga, right? Or the the Greek toga, um, I forget. That being the case, when you've now inherited a tradition where certain groups dress like X, Y, or Z, 
why codify it? Like why or like why organize a society that way if when you go to um you know you see someone who's dressed like you and um you know you say Nazelsin instead of Aidarbohat, right? <laughs> like normally for us language would be the identifier. We wouldn't mm. we wouldn't count the outward appearance because you know, like everything is hegemonized these days. We all wear, you know, blue jeans, Northern California invention. Um, you know, everyone's got blue jeans, blue jeans, even in Russia, we have blue jeans. And, um, you know, we got t-shirts, right? Like things are pretty standard nowadays, but why separate a society, especially, you know, is it to, I don't know, is it to identify potential threats within, um, or is it, something else that I can't imagine. I, I'm just, I don't have the answer listeners. I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. I, I think codifying it is what made it problematic because then you couldn't see before that you could dress however you want based on what your people were, but you were a Roman citizen with the Muslim empires. It was different. You were only a first class citizen if you were a Muslim. And so uh, this is why clothing became codified and then, do, be, in a sense, even more important than in the Roman days. Because now everyone needed to know uh, if, from something outward if you were a Muslim or not. Whereas the Roman citizenship, I think it was a certificate or so. I can't remember what it was, how they were able to tell. Uh, but it didn't matter what your religion was or what your ethnicity was. In uh, in the Ottoman days, it did matter what your religion was for uh, up to an extent. Eventually, they abolished the jizya, the Ottomans. But before, and uh, the the caliphates before them, um, this is how society functioned. And it didn't mean that there weren't high-ranking Christians and th things like that. Uh, but it just meant that... Um, the uh, by the letter of the law, which again wasn't always applied because in Arab societies that's not how they work. Um, that was the letter of the law. Yeah, I mean, there's the the matter of mobilizing different communities. So, you know, if you saw recently, you know, with the invasion, the Russian invasion in Ukraine, um, you see like Chechen brigades mobilized. You know, and, Tatars. Yeah. yeah. And so is there any um any way in which you know the the peoples are mobilized on behalf of the empire? Um, you know, what's the, the deal with the genissary, you know, soldier and could they keep identity or are they Turkish sized or what happens what happens in the Ottoman period, you know, to a lot of these groups, you know, and are they able to yeah. kind of maintain status quo? Or um, some, you know, do they so, shift? Do they change at all? So a lot of these things kind of died out by the turn of the 20th century. This is why the Ottomans were called the, the sick man of Europe, because their power was going away. They, they, their expansion and strength was, was, it was really based on their ability to expand territorially. And since their loss at Vienna, they were just never the same after that. So, uh, but until that happened, and and they try they tried to keep it going and were unable to. Their strongest uh, force was the Janissaries, which I don't know if the, if the viewers know. These were boys who were taken from Christian homes and uh, raised and converted. They were Turkified and Islamized, uh, and and uh, put into this this unit. Uh, this fighting force called the Janissaries. Um, and this continued to be the backbone of the Ottoman uh, military until, again, the Battle of Vienna, and they just kind of went back until they kind of, until World War One. I, I think by that time, they only, as far as Europe goes, they might have only had, I think, as far as... Uh, what the, what the state of Turkey has today um, on the European side of things. I, I think 
before them, a lot of civilizations also did this, where they would bring groups and put them on fringes of the empire so as to to take away their strength. But also, even in, in uh, what is it called, when they, uh, when they bring people into the military. Uh, they conscript. Conscript, yes. Um, they, uh, they would take, let's say, if they're conscripting Greeks, they would make them fight on the Arab Arabian side or like this so as to prevent betrayal, as to prevent, uh, um, what is it called when they run away? They desert. Desert, yes, desertion. Um, they, are, they would, whoever they're uh, conscripting, they're making them fight on uh, like opposite sides of the empire uh, and they don't, they're usually not with their own people. I use the Greek as an example, but most likely they probably would not have had a Greek Christian in the military unless, again, he was a Janissary boy yeah. that they had Islam and Turkified. Uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk himself is from Thessaloniki. Um, so he might have actually been an ethnic Greek. That's part of the issue that a lot of folks may not realize is, you know, the, the Turk, the Gük Turk. Um, is Central Asian, right, historically. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the people we look at who look just like the people in Syria or Iraq or um, even in other parts of the Middle East um, genetically might be local to the region, you know, in, in spite of the the identity shift. Yeah, I was surprised. I was, when I was in Turkey in April, a lot of them somehow were able to preserve the look um, and like you said, there are a lot that look actually European or like uh, Semitic. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a guy in college, Ahmed, who, you know, was far wider than me, you know, much blonder. Mm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Like yeah. they're, they're a melting pot. Um, yeah. Okay. They usually so know. they usually know if you ask them, they'll tell you, oh, my grandfather was Ukrainian. My grandfather was this. So. Yeah. It's an interesting matter, right? Because there's the, the historical Central Asian you know, Seljuk Turk, who comes to the region, settles, you know, and becomes an imperial power. Um, but a lot of those people who take on that identity, you know, they may not genetically be from the Central Asia. And, um, but nevertheless, like that's sort of, that's what becomes the definition of Turk later on, right? And so it's that mestizo culture, if I could call it that, you know, of the local people, you know, with um, the Central Asian Turkish um, heritage and tradition. And like for, for those listening, if, you, if you've ever heard Turkish spoken, um, it sounds nothing like anything from the Middle East. It's an Altaic language closer to Korean, Japanese, and Mongolian than it is to the Middle Eastern languages. Now, that being said, there's a lot of loan words from Arabic in, in Turkish. So like you can sometimes um uh fake it right like you know you look at a turkish newspaper i can identify a, a good chunk of the the vocabulary because of like arabic or you know other semitic you know connections it has but um like fundamentally as a people group it's a it's a different people group and so um there's the question of the the people who come from central asia and then the the making of that identity um, especially during the ottoman period right like they're there before they're there at the time of the crusades um you know but it's really during the ottoman period where you get you know this call it a newer i, I don't want to call it a new identity but you know what i'm talking about it's uh, yeah, yeah. something uh, that's developed you know like we're americans right and um what makes us american right like there were things that went into this melting pot that you know centered around english language um at least you know the laws we inherited from uh, britain and the way we in america reacted to those our reaction to that yeah so bef at the turn of the 20th century uh there was let's say and even before since the fall of the arab caliphate and when the turks took over the arabs went back to what they were socially before Islam in that they they now retreated to the desert and then began to raid the cities. So they were they were raiding like say Damascus or Baghdad or whatever that were under the Turkish uh, state because the Turks were unable to subjugate Arabia. So then when the people, the Ottoman subjects were being raided by 
the, the Arabs, they would write to their governors or whoever is in charge under the Ottoman state, um, these Arabs are an annoyance, as if the person complaining is not an Arab. Let's so say even if he's a, a like Syrian Muslim from Damascus, but he's an urban, settled person, and when he's saying the word Arab, he means it's the Bedouin from the desert, not me. These guys are raiding us. Protect us from these Arabs. And then when the revolt is happening in World War I, it's happening from the tribal Arabs in Arabia. So that is a different identity now uh, that's, that's taking shape, um, the, the Turkish one, I mean. So, and the, the whole point of the Young Turk movement, which is a little bit after the period we're talking about, going into World War I particularly, the point of that is the centralization of the, the Ottoman Empire to Turkify its subjects, to get its subjects to identify as Turks. So um, with the borders that cur are currently in place um, of the Republic of Turkey, and even if they were bigger, these settled people, uh, let's say in Urfa, or let's say in Antioch, or even if you want to give Turkey more land in Mosul or Kirkuk or Damascus or wherever, if they are not tribal Bedouin Arabs, they would, with time, just like in Antioch and, and Urfa, begin to then identify as Turks. They're part of the Turkish state. They have Turkish citizenship. This was the goal of the Young Turk movement. So uh, the, 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 Turk, the Turkish state dealing with non-Turkish subjects um, was going in a direction so as not to exist anymore. Like even the Kurds at a time, they began to call them mountain Turks. And uh, uh, if, even when we speak colloquially with, b between each other, we're talking about um, the, the, Assyrian, the Assyrians who have Turkish citizenship. In Arabic, we call them atrak, to dis differentiate. We call them Turks, even though I don't do that. But a lot of people do that. I don't like to do that. So um, it's, it was going in, in a direction that any subject of the Ottoman Empire that is not a tribal Bedouin Arab is not an Arab. He would be a Turk. Like, what are we missing, you know, from this time and space? You know, what is the kind of the takeaway from the period? Like, when I think about Turkification, I think about, you know, it's not like it's, if you make it a word, Right. It sounds, um, I don't know. Uh, well, it is, a, it's driven by an agenda, sure, but it sounds foreign. But, sure. you know, go to the West, right? Like, especially today in the post colonial era, but even, you know, in the early, um, well, North American era, people are Canadians, they're um, Americans from the United States, you know, they're Mexicans. Like, I, I know several. Yeah. This um, was the goal. Middle Eastern yeah, Jews who are Mexican, but like oh, now wow. they're Mexican, right? Like it's, yeah. you know, there's the new identities constructed in, um, in these movements. So we can Americanize, we can Canadianize, we can Anglicize if you're in, in, in jolly old England, um, mm -hmm. you know, people get different citizenships, but the citizenship sometimes, you know, has a, you know, depending on the country, you may still kind of be a, a foreigner within the country, even if you do get citizenship. But with us, um, creating common identity is not a new thing. It's, it's who and what we are. And even for the Middle East, I mean, this is one of the innovations of ancient Assyria, you know, uh, among the different ancient um, communities. And we'll come back to this as we go back in time. You know, this is going to end up being a class, by the way. Uh, but as we go back in time, you see ancient Assyria is the first community to take in outsiders and Assyrianize them so that now there's a, a there's an identity that's exported beyond the local right so you don't have to come from Central Asia necessarily to be a Turk right um, there's sure. different ways of measuring it you know whether you're from the mountains or the city right you you know speak um, a certain language in a certain way um, that all goes into the development of identity mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, you have uh, 
the a good portion of Turkey today, the Republic of Turkey, um, is not Anatolia. So, like uh, everything south of the Taurus and Nur Mountains, um, that is Syria until now. It says that's uh, stolen North Syria. Um, and uh, the people there, you will find them to be very ethnically diverse. Uh, but at the end of the day, they carry Turkish citizenship and they speak Turkish. Um, they're unaware of, uh, not all of them, but some of them are unaware of being anything but Turkish. Well, um, any parting thoughts you, know, you want to give our viewers or listeners? Uh, yeah, I think uh, this is sounds like all of this maybe sounded super nerdy and boring, but I promise you, <laughs> it's important. And uh, uh, a lot of what's going on in the world today, and uh, with Russia, Ukraine being like the, probably the biggest thing, uh, maybe related, even if indirectly with Turkey being involved, it all kind of stems from where we've arrived from that world. So it's important, I think for everyone to have some kind of knowledge concerning these things. Awesome. Well, when you come back, um, we're going to go even further back in time and get to the point, you know, where we have the Ottoman rise um, and the Abbasid decline, you know, and sure. um, we can get into some of the, the Arabic speaking empires of the period or of the period prior to um, the Ottomans. Sounds good. Thank you, my phone. Okay, come back soon. We'll talk.